Hey guys, welcome to The Great Escape and part two of the record-breaking interview with frontier consciousness author and explorer Anthony Peek. Part one of this epic three-hour interview, the longest for both Anthony and myself, posted last week and the feedback has been phenomenal. So thank you guys for all the great comments. I am massively excited to bring you round two of the holographic episode where Anthony sheds light on things like symbols, DMT, the pineal gland, and gets you asking the question, could there be trillions of you? Stephen Hawking thinks so. All this and more. So get ready to delve deeper into the matrix right after this. Okay, I'm going to assume that you have heard part one and that your mind has since recovered from being officially blown and now you're back for more. If you didn't hear part one of this episode already, I definitely highly recommend you check it out because you'll hear a very important part of why I invited Anthony to be on this show in the first place, which was to quiz him about my own extraordinary experience in 2012. Now, in this episode, if you hear a light tapping sometimes in the audio, it is not an alien Morse code trying to communicate with you. It is the sound of British central heating, which is one step up from a matchstick. So don't get your conspiracy on if you hear what does actually sound like alien Morse code. Right, now we are diving in. Right where we left off last week with Anthony speaking about children with autism and what else they might be able to be or do. Let's hear what the brilliant mind of author, speaker, researcher, Anthony Peake has to say. This proves that people who are autistic are telepathic. There's telepathy taking place here. I have evidence of people, I worked for a period of time last year with a charity that deals with children who are autistic and have epilepsy. I used to speak to the people who worked with these children. The amount of times they said, of course they're telepathic, it happens all the time. There are no clocks in the houses, but the kids know when the food should be, to the minute. And because they're autistic, a lot of them are very, very particular when things should happen. And Mm. if they don't happen to the minute, they get hysterical. But there's no clocks. But they know and they'd say, we'd watch to the minute and we'd watch till the second got to five o'clock. And then at two seconds past five, they're going. Yeah. There are many, many examples. And I give many examples because these are all to do with what I call the, the Bergsonian spectrum. It's to do with Henri Bergson and, and also the Huxleyan spectrum as well to do with Aldous Huxley. And what I argue is that most of us who are neurotypical do not access this other world. Because our brains are locked down, our communication channels between our daemon and the reality outside are locked down. We don't have extraordinary experiences. Most scientists do not have extraordinary experiences. Therefore, they don't believe they exist because they haven't happened to them. As soon as a scientist has an extraordinary experience, the whole game changes. We'll have a drink afterwards and they say, yeah, I know I was saying all that, but there's one thing I couldn't explain happened to me a few years ago. And I said, well, why didn't you say that in the interview? Right. I can't. I have tenure. Right. I cannot be seen to be right. being interested not in Not knowing things. something. I can't be yes. seen not understanding I can't be seen something. Not understanding it and not showing it. So at the far end, there are neurotypicals. There's then a spectrum that, that people run through where the doors of perception become more and more open. And I'm still trying to figure out where certain areas fit. But as I say, migraine is in there. People who have migraine on occasions have um they see little people as well in the same way as people with Alzheimer's do. This is very strange about the seeing the little people. It's it's a known effect. I mean, effectively, you look up Charles Bonnet syndrome, it's a known syndrome. You know, it's not again out there, something weird and wonderful. It's there. It is known. It is diagnosed. The question is, what are they seeing? Yeah, and are these people existing somewhere else in our world well this is it they have motivations one one lady who was a young woman who had migraine said she sat and watched how did she describe it now there was a little police car 
came across her carpet. Little policeman got out and there was a man pulling a cow. And the policeman went over and had an argument with the man pulling the cow. And then he continued walking across the carpet. And she said they were all about six inches high. And she watched this happen. You know, and these beings will speak to you sometimes. They'll acknowledge you. Now, my argument is this is what happens in dimethyltryptamine. Because when people have DMT trips, if you read the research of Rick Strassman, who was the guy who had a grant from the American government to do research in DMT at the University of Arizona, I think it was Arizona, New Mexico, University of New Mexico in the, 19, in the early 1990s. He had people who volunteered to take DMT. I bet. <laughs> and they took it and he reported. And guess what they saw? They saw greys. They saw aliens. Wow. They felt they were being abducted. They ended up having experiments done on them in exactly the same way as Whitley Strieber describes it. These, these are things that are a continuum. These are things that are consistent. And I believe that the DMT in the brain of people with Alzheimer's and everything else is what's facilitating these perceptions. They're having DMT trips. I'll guarantee that these migrainers and other individuals that see these things on migraine states are actually having mini DMT trips. I mean, after uh, when I started to tell people about my experience a lot of people naturally said to me, oh my gosh, did you take LSD, mushrooms or something? And I haven't taken drugs like this, but now I have an interest to, because I'm so curious to see if, if there's a correlation with what was happening in my brain and that effect can be achieved with magic mushrooms and, yeah. uh, uh, you know, LSD and stuff. I'm curious, really curious, if I would see the same thing again or if it would be a different experience. I, I, I have the impression from my research, and I again, if anybody's interested, if you go on to something called Breaking Convention, um, I did a presentation at the University of Greenwich last summer, and this has proven to be, I mean, they've been doing this for years. They've done it about six of them, I think. Mine's only been uploaded the video of my presentation has only been uploaded since uh, September and it's already the second most popular most liked presentation they've ever had and I think it's the fifth most watched they've ever had and in this I discuss about DMT hallucinations how they can be linked how there is evidence that it's the pineal gland I mean for instance one of the things that many of your listeners may or may have experienced in the past particularly people who do deep meditative states, particularly people who do yoga and various other sorts. There's a particular sort of yoga that particularly integrates this. It's something where they taste something called the nectar of transcendence. Mm. It's a taste in the back of the throat. Now, the Indians have a technique they use called Kakara Mudra. And Kakara Mudra is where you place your tongue at the back of your throat to taste this nectar. Okay. Wow which apparently happens in altered states of consciousness. I know what's happening here. At the 49th day of gestation, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland are placed at the back of the throat. Okay, so as the embryo grows, they're at the back of the throat. 49th day of gestation, if you look up Buddhist techniques, Buddhist belief systems, it's when the soul enters the body. Mm. And it's at this point that the pituitary and pineal body starts to move up from the back of the throat to the center of the brain. And then they split up into the pineal gland and the pituitary gland. They leave a very, very thin kind of cleft called Rathke's pouch, which for some people connects it at the back of the throat. Now, imagine the scenario that the pineal gland does generate dimethyltryptamine. If the pineal gland does generate dimethyltryptamine, some of it will drip down Rathke's pouch and we'll end up at the back of the throat. Mm. This is the nectar of transcendence. It's also known as um, soma. And in my book, The Infinite Mind Field, I actually take the reader on a journey from ancient Egypt across to ancient Sumer, up to India and everything else, and along the Silk Road, looking up legends to do with soma, to do with the nectar of transcendence, things about the pineal gland and belief systems. And I believe that all this can be linked because, for instance, I believe that the secret of the pineal gland has been known for centuries. It's hidden in plain sight. Do you know the caduceus? Okay. The caduceus is the symbol that doctors have 
Oh, have, yes, yeah, yes, yes with the snakes, snakes around it. Yes, okay. I just forgot it was called that. That is actually taken from the Asclepion and it is from ancient Greeks. It's called the Staff of Osiris from ancient Egypt or the Staff of Hermes. If you look at it, it's quite interesting. You have a staff going up the middle, then you have these two snakes going up and the two snakes' heads come at the top and there mm. then are two wings and a circle. The thing up the middle is the spinal cord. The two snakes are two things called the Ida and the Pingala. It's to do with Kundalini awakenings. Okay, and the Ida and Pingala go up to the top and the two wings are the hemispheres of the brain. Mm. What's the circle in the middle? It's the pineal gland. When people have these kind of awakenings, when they have Kundalini awakenings, there is this electric shock that goes up from the base of the spine to the center of the brain and then explodes. That is DMT running up the spine. What's the symbol of the snakes? The symbol of the snakes is going back to what I was saying about the legends of ayahuasca. What do people see? They see snakes. Mm. The snakes are symbols of DNA. It's the double helix. Right. It's again DNA talking to us. Mm. Now, if you look at symbolism... From ancient belief systems, from the mystic traditions, what do you find? They have the caduceus. What do you see in Masonic symbolism? You find Masonic signs in buildings. I've found them all over New York. What do they have? They have the snakes. You'll love this. I think you'll love this. On one of my post-it note adventures between 3 and 4 a.m., the information that came to me, and this sounds real, this sounds so hardcore conspiracy, and again, comes from no frame of research I had anything to do with. But I wrote it down. This just came to me and I wrote it down three in the morning. The alphabet is based on ancient symbols that are more powerful than we could ever realize. And they are used for good and also for bad. And then I think I wrote a little bit more about that. But that was the core of it. And right at this same time, right after the experience symbols were jumping out at me everywhere and in particular on the backs of cars when I was driving and I, I would see all of the car symbols were jumping out at me uh, almost invasively I felt like I wanted to look away from them these ovals and the way car symbols when you look at them they're pretty clever symbols and mm. I saw I saw uh, is it Michael Tazarian yes yes who does speeches and I found him and he said that these link to just what you were saying, that we have some sort of ancestral ancient association with these symbols. And they can be used to give us messages that we may not want to receive to sell us things, for example, in commerce, oh, yes. i.e. car logos. And when I was watching television, because right after the Oscars was coming on, this is a really strange one and maybe hark to your experience when you saw the outer space and the planet. In graphics, in commercials, visual graphics use a lot of galaxy-looking effects mm -hmm. done in Adobe After Effects. There's a lot of little starscapes bursting up on fonts. And the Oscars was on, and every time they brought up um, a graphic, it had these little whooshes of galaxy. And I had these powerful feelings hitting me. Every time I would see these little galaxies going up on TV and in commercials. I remember some phone ad and I, I think it was Samsung and there was, there was some sort of outer space looking galaxy graphic going on. And I felt this deep connection like you would if you were going home. It was that deep. Mm. It was a feeling of home and recognition. But it made me angry because somehow I felt they're trying to sell me a phone by tapping into yeah. something so deep that I don't even understand. Why am I looking at outer space and feeling a kinship, a deep sense of home, a pining? I felt a pining. Well, Philip K. Dick would argue that you're a starseed. And he argued in his book that he, or in his uh, exegesis, that there were certain elements of the things he saw which made him believe that he was... He, he, he had come from somewhere else. And in fact, um, I contacted a, a very old friend of his who he'd worked with. And there's a very famous interview he does with a guy called Brad Steiger, if you come across Brad Steiger's work, uh, which they discuss in great detail Phil's ideas of this kind of resonation. 
Now, the resonation point is a fascinating one because we could argue that the Kabbalah, the whole basic point of the Kabbalah, is, is the use of symbolism, the use of, of the, the Hebrew, Hebrew alphabet. And each number and each symbol has a very, very powerful meaning. Now, again, in my research, in my book, The Out of the Body Experience, I spent a lot of time chatting with a rabbi in Manitou Springs in Colorado. And this rabbi was telling me, he's, he's a fascinating guy because he's worked with Rick Strassman. He's very, very interested in DMT. And his work goes on about how you can find DMT and snake symbolism within the Kabbalah. It's hidden within the texts themselves. It's a guy called Joel Baxt. Again, somebody I strongly advise you, you, you link in with. He's a fascinating guy. He's a fount of knowledge. And he's taking some very, very interesting angles on symbolism. For instance, Joel points out the way in which in the Bible, the place where, you know, Jacob's ladder, where mm -hmm. Jacob has this thing of seeing things going up to heaven. In Aramaic, the place that that took place is called Pineal. Oh, wow. And again, you know, this is, this is intriguing stuff. You know, what, yeah. what, <laughs> what's, what's the angle here? And he argues that the Pineal gland again is it, it, it was part of the, the Moses and the burning bush, the symbolism, because of course it's all symbolism. But then again, you start to then look into ancient Egyptian belief systems and sacred geometry. And another associate of mine pointed this out to me, which is in another of my books, is the, the actual symbolism of the word pyramid. It's Greek, pyramidus, fire in the middle. The pineal gland is the fire in the middle of the brain. Again, if you actually look at the, the, the design of the Great Pyramid mm. and you look at the sacred geometry of how they symbolize into the bodies, the pineal gland is standing out. It is so obvious. For instance, I believe I went out to Angkor Wat in Cambodia a few years ago and spent time wandering around the site. I am convinced that the actual symbolism in the, the actual five towers, they're bloody big pine cones. Mm. They're pine cones. But the really, really weird thing is, again, my link with the two Austra Austrian researchers. The Austrian researchers a few years ago, together with Professor Erlenda Haraldson, who's Professor of Psychology at the University of Iceland, they took one of these lucid light devices out with them to uh, Lhasa, Tibet. And while they were in Tibet, they tested some monks of the Bon tradition. Now, I don't know if you know about the Bon tradition, the Bon tradition is the original shamanic belief system of the Tibetan plateau. And when Buddhism came up from the plains of India, being a very syncretic religion, very much a religion that takes in ideas, they incorporated the Bon tradition, the shamanic tradition, in with the Buddhist tradition. The Buddhists then incorporated the Bon tradition into Tibetan Buddhism. And it meant that Tibetan Buddhism was slightly different to other areas of Buddhism because there's this, this whole shamanic tradition. And what the Austrians did was that they tested the lucid light device with these guys because they wanted to know, because these guys had spent many, many years training as Buddhist monks. So here was an opportunity to see whether the lucid light device could stimulate anything in those. And they had them seeing mandalas within seconds. And the Buddhist monks reacted by saying this was the most amazing experience ever. And they were really quite worried that people could instantaneously get these effects when it would take years of training to get similar effects training yourself. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about the side of the story was that the next day they were they were given some of the freedom. I don't know if they were in the Patala Palace or whether they were in another palace, I don't know, but they had the freedom of wandering around. And they, they found a room, and inside the room were these glass cases. And inside the glass cases were these objects. And they discovered that the objects were actually ossified pineal glands of elephants and various other animals that were just kept in glass cases. Wow. Uh, and nobody really knew why they were there. They actually asked the question and said, you know, why do you keep these? And they weren't sure. So clearly, again, we have a very ancient tradition here that again has the symbol of the pineal gland. But of course, we have the, the idea of the pineal gland because of course, it's the, the only sing major singular object in the brain. So therefore, if you take somebody's brain apart and you pull the bits apart, the one thing you will notice is this one singular wow. object that's in the brain. And it actually has a little sort of eye lens on it, it does. doesn't it? It like does, in fact. Eye. There's something called a tatura, which is a New, New Zealand lizard that actually has the third eye. The pineal gland is in the centre of the forehead and it can actually see. Wow. Now, on top of this, what is even more curious is that the optic nerve actually runs directly below the pineal gland. And there's a reason for that. 
because the, the, the pineal gland needs to be aware, even though it's in the centre of the brain, whether it's light or dark outside. And the reason for this is it excretes something called melatonin. And melatonin mm. is the chemical that makes you go to sleep. So therefore, it has to be close to the optic nerve to realise that. And this is why people screw up their sleep by being on their computers before Correct. bedtime, because the light is signalling to your brain that it's still daylight. Yes, the, so the melatonin right. is not released. And of course, melatonin is very much to do with the sleep cycles. Now, an associate of mine, Beach Barrett, is suggesting that endogenous, that is internally generated dimethyltryptamine, which is supposedly generated by the pineal gland, in fact, is a change on melatonin. He calls it metatonin. And he says, effectively, endogenous DMT should be given its own term, which is metatonin. And if we then realise that this substance is a neurotransmitter, we can move on. And in fact, Rick Strassman, the guy who wrote the book on DMT, the spirit molecule, mm. has argued that there is strong evidence to assume that dimethy dimethyltryptamine is in fact our reality modulator. This is the thing that creates the reality around us, which wow. of course is in keeping with my overall hypothesis that this is a simulation and our facilitator within the simulation is the pineal gland and DMT. Would the DMT then be linked with the things like Alzheimer's that maybe it starts to shut down production so you don't maintain the illusion, yeah. so to speak? Yeah, no, that's a very good point <laughs> in, in that that is probably, yeah, the reason is that the ability to keep the illusion going is eroded. The doors of perception are being opened because we can't deal with it. There was a wonderful quotation that I've adapted that I first came across many years ago, written by a guy called Rainer Johnson, who was an English physicist who went to live in Australia and in his later years became schizophrenic. Because of course, schizophrenia is in here as well. Schizophrenia is when the doors are wide open mm. and you just can't even take it all in because it's just coming in. And he used this analogy and I've, I've adapted it. And basically I suggest that Imagine you've lived all your life in one of those Irish frown towers that you see in Ireland. You know, the kind of round towers, that like, you know, like Rapunzel. Like a lighthouse? Well, no, you know, like the, the, the story of Rapunzel okay. where she lets her down. She right. lives in the top of one of those okay. tow round towers. So imagine you're Rapunzel living all your life in the top of one of these towers. And the outside world, you, you see through five slits mm. in the walls. Right. And they're your five senses. And this is how you perceive the world. Mm. Becoming schizophrenic or acquiring schizophrenia or experiencing schizophrenia, whichever term we want to use, because they're all pejorative and all quite dangerous in many ways. But when you start to perceive schizophrenia, it's like you've noticed a trap door in the roof and you're allowed to come out mm. and you pull yourself out and you see reality as it really is. Now, if that is the case, no wonder you're overwhelmed. No right. wonder schizophrenics hearing voices here, there and everywhere that they're being told to do things. Just the barriers are broken down mm. and the, the alternate realities. Because who knows whether there are entities within these alternate realities. I've no way of knowing. But all I know is there does seem to be their own motivations, it, creatures that people experience in DMT dreams seem to have their own motivations. Terence McKenna called them the machine elves. They seem to have their own plans. Like, for instance, one of the most fascinating things, um, have you come across the work of Robert Wagoner at all? No, only, uh, only in Heart to Heart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very the good. The actor, Robert Wagoner. <laughs> I'm afraid that's the extent of my research. <laughs> With Stephanie uh, Powers. Is this what you're referring yeah. to? Andy? What was the dog called? <laughs> what was the dog called? What was? Freeway. Freeway, that's it. Freeway, yeah, we dog. got it. God, God, there's a voice in here. Obviously, something just broke through from the beyond the veil. There was another male voice. Did you hear it? I did. I did. Yeah. Ooh. It's my sound engineer. You, this is a high tech podcast. I have an actual sound engineer with me. Woo, freaky. <laughs> uh, yeah. So going back from that little aside, um, Robert was, Wagner. Robert Wagner. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And freeway. Robert Robert Wagner is an American guy. I think he lives in Des Moines. I think somewhere like that. Although, Des Moines. Des Moines. Sorry, Des Moines. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Des Moines. Silly me. Hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll, I could go off on a side there, but I won't. I won't because I'll get carried away with something <laughs> will else. It, will it include the word derriere if you go off on an aside? It could do. So we won't go there, will we? You know, no, too cheeky. Can't do that. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> sorry. 
<laughs> it's, it's my daemon. It takes over occasionally and makes p- the most awful puns. Your daemon is a stand-up comic from the 1950s. <laughs> yeah, with, with very, very questionable taste in humour. The Borscht Belt. <laughs> Absolutely. The Borscht Belt. That's a good one. The Borscht Belt. Yeah, that's what they referred. I don't even know where it stems. I think it was like Russian Jewish yeah, it's Russian, people it, Borscht, uh, yeah. eating the stews and stuff. It was called the Borscht Belt of these excellent comics. There must know. be DNT in Borscht somewhere, maybe. <laughs> anyway. But we digress from... We digress. Sorry, Robert, if you're listening or you're listening, um, Mm. because I'll be interviewing in a few weeks' time on my show. And I've interviewed him in the past. Robert is one of the world's leading authorities on um, the lucid dreaming phenomenon. And in fact, I think I'm right in saying that he was one of the people who was approached by the director of Inception, whose name I should remember, but I don't. I can't remember either. No, I should do. I should do. Anyway, he's done a whole series. I just remember Leonardo DiCaprio, because who wouldn't? Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking of the little tiny Canadian girl that was in it was really good as well. Okay. So different, different. You notice different things. You're bound to want you. Derriere. Okay. Derriere. We carry yeah. on. We carry on. So Robert has written a series of books on lucid dreaming and how to facilitate lucid dreaming. And as you know, lucid dreaming is becoming self-aware of the fact that you're in a dream. And when you do that, you can manipulate the dream scape to, to do things. And Robert has been fascinated by the people he meets when he's lucid dreaming because he tended to assume they were all just figments of his own imagination. So therefore he could manipulate the people around him. And there was one sequence where he describes where he was flying, because in one of the things you can test if you're lucid dreaming to become lucid is to see if you fly. And if you pick your feet up off the ground and you find you can float, you realize you're dreaming. And then you can say, hey, I'm in a dream, I'm dreaming. The other way apparently is to look at your hand. And you look at your hand in a dream and think, why am I looking at my hand? I'm looking at my hand because I want... Am I dreaming? That kind of thing. So this shows you you are dreaming. Yes. If you look at your hand, it if there's means something you're that you need to do in the dream to break you out of the amnesia. Check this out, An- Anthony. <gasps> what does this mean? I'm looking at my hand. You're dreaming. I'm dreaming. This is a dream. Yeah. Well, there you go. So look at your hands. So in fact, I look at my hands all the time. So I'm in a continual dream state. But anyway, you remember in the movie, he he has a totem. He has a, a thing. He spins. Do you remember? And it's, again, to make you realise you're in a dream okay. state. So you're, there's various a ways. A little clue for yourself. Little clues to make you wake up within the dream. Um, again, have, have you seen the, mo- the Linklater movie, Waking Life? No, I have haven't. You've seen that? Okay, because that, that, again, the central character there is somebody trying to know whether he's in a dream or not. And he talks to various people. And Philip K. Dick is registered in there, for instance. Hmm. Um, some very interesting conversations in there. Very interesting movie, Richard Linklater. Um, who also did the Philip K. Dick movies as well. And did Boyhood. I didn't know that one. Because that's Richard Linklater who did the Oscar-winning film Boyhood, or at least Oscar-nominated, right? Yeah, Oscar-winning. Oh, right. No, I didn't yeah. have to check that one out because I adore his movies. He's very, very it was a, Its big thing was that he follows a, a kid from when he's kid through his adult life, and I believe it was shot over 12 years. Oh, so right. nobody had ever shot a Typical, movie like yeah. this. So. Christopher Nolan, by the way, is the guy that wrote, that did Perception. Okay. I, I hate myself. Inception? Inception, Inception. Yeah. okay. Did I say? <laughs> Perception. Perception. <laughs> it's because you're dreaming. Because I'm dreaming, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So anyway, back to, to good old Robert. And in the sequence, he, he, he starts flying and there's a group of people walking along with hats. And for a bit of fun, he decides, I'm going to knock the hats off. As he's flying along, as he's coming, he's knocking the hats off. Then suddenly one of the people puts his hands up and holds the hat to his head to stop him doing it. And as Robert flies past and he couldn't knock the hat off, he, he goes, that was weird. That person knew I was going to do that. Hmm. That wasn't in my dream plan. That showed sentience. And since then, he's been able to, I think I'm right in saying, go into dream sequences and he actually has been able to meet people who are also lucid dreaming. Mm. And he said, sometimes you'll meet people and they will look slightly confused. They're there with you, but they're not sentient of the fact that they're themselves. Mm. Now, if this is the case, this means there's a place we can go when we dream. And I believe in my book, The Outer Body Experience, I suggest that lucid dreaming and out of the body experiences are very, very similar. Because there's an awful lot of evidence that when people are in out of body experiences, they go to places or they walk around their bedroom, but it's not quite the bedroom that they remember. Mm. In other words, it's being created from the memories of the bedroom. And this is why you will never really effectively have tangible proof that somebody's outside of their body when they're in an out of body situation. Because there's 
People will contradict me on this, but I don't know of any real powerful evidence that somebody has seen something in an out-of-body state that they couldn't have already known. Mm. The people will cite examples and they'll say, uh, Charles Tart did an experiment with um, a young woman uh, called w Woman X, I think it was, or something, whereby she supposedly was able to read a six-digit number that had been above bed level mm. when she was in an out-of-body experience. Um, I have reasons to believe that that wasn't quite how it happened, but I won't go into details now, but in my book I discuss this. Also, people who remote view, people like Ingo Swan. I mean, one of the major examples of Ingo Swan, who was one of the most famous remote viewers, was that he saw the, um, the uh, rings of Jupiter before it, it was actually discovered by wow. the, the mariner or whatever, the spaceship that got wow. out there. That's not quite true. What, it, what he actually said was that the, they saw things that looked like the rings of Saturn. Hmm. Um, and he said they were coming out of the planet, not round it. The second thing he said, which I think is more pertinent, was that he could see volcanoes coming out of the clouds, the cloudscape of Jupiter, which is impossible because Jupiter is a gas giant and there are no volcanoes on Jupiter. Um, so clearly whatever he was seeing was not quite what our reality was. Hmm. But I don't necessarily diss the fact that he was in some form of altered state of consciousness, but I don't think necessarily the information he brought back was as, as convincing I mean, I, re I remain convinced. I mean, if people can actually bring forward evidence for me, that's fine. This is why Graham Nichols and I now work together, because Graham claims he can see things in the outer body states which are in consensual reality. And the things he's said he can do convince me quite strongly that it could be the case. I but remember reading Robert Bruce's book a while ago about um, having outer body experiences, because I had one many, many years ago, nothing terribly exciting really and I wasn't into anything like this but it just happened one night I was lying on my bed at the Oakwood Apartments in Los Angeles and I literally floated up to the ceiling and I was nose to popcorn would they call it popcorn ceiling where right. it's that old plaster with yeah, little yeah. peaks on it you know and my face was right in front of the popcorn ceiling and I didn't have control over myself it only ever happened the once and I drifted through the wall and I was seeing all the back of the wall, this uh, like the studs of the wall and the metal backs of the plugs, plug outlets. It was all very messy. And then I drifted back because I was quite afraid. And, and I at the point I got really afraid because I thought maybe I was not going to go back in my body. Perhaps this is death or whatever. And I just went thump back into my body and my upper thighs were really sore straight away like I'd done a workout of tons and tons of leg squats with weights my tops mm. of my legs were burning which is really strange and that was my experience I presume that you haven't read any of the books by Robert Munro no now no. that's interesting because the description you gave there is almost exactly what happened to Robert Munro mm. um, when he found himself the first time out of his body and he was actually at the ceiling and he thought he was on the floor and he pushed back and he was just floating backwards and forwards. And then he turned round to see himself and his wife in the bed. He then had the same scenario when he was able to go through the adjoining areas between the floors of the apartments to see underneath. And I think he went down to the floor below and he mm. found nails and things that mm. were sticking up, which he subsequently checked and were there. Mm. Now... Robert Munro is very intriguing, uh, and if I strongly suggest anybody gets the opportunity to read his, his, his series of books, I think it's three or four of them, because one of them is very intriguing, where, and I love this story. I don't think I've actually mentioned this in any of my interviews, but I love this story, where he, he became somebody he called I there. In other words, he discovered that there was another version of him living in an alternate reality, um, and on occasions, in out-of-body experiences, he would end up taking over the body of what he called I there, wow. the other person. And there was one sequence where he ends up in the body, he's dreaming away, and then suddenly he finds himself in the body of I there. And I there is having a conversation with a man sitting opposite, and he realises that I there is pitching for a business deal. <laughs> and he doesn't... And Robert's in his body... And he doesn't know what the hell to talk about. So he starts kind of winging it and saying, well, you know. And he said, I could see either's wife looking at him going. 
like that. And he said, I was there for about three or four minutes and then I was back in my body again. Oh, and he said it must have been from either's point of view as if he'd had a blackout. Now, I believe that either had had at that time a temporal lobe absence seizure. And from either's point of view, he'd had a mini blackout because, you know, absence seizures. Absence seizures is when it's a part of temporal lobe epilepsy where they, they just stop and stare at you for a second and then go like this. Don't we all do that? Sometimes? Not, not to the same extent. I mean, I'll give you an example of an absence seizure that I witnessed um, because in my first book, I deal with temporal lobe epilepsy and I have a lot of temporal lobe epileptics, people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy, who have written to me from around the world. It's known as the diviner's disease. In mm. fact, most shamans are normally temporal lobe epileptics. Mm. So it's, it's known for being something quite strange. Um, and this lady um, from Liverpool contacted me and we arranged to meet up at a coffee shop in a bookshop called Borders, which I think you have yeah, in the States Borders. as well. And this particular coffee shop in Liverpool had a mezzanine floor at the back and the coffee shop was at the back and you overlooked the rest of the, um, the bookshop and the entrance was in the front. So you had a view of people coming in and out. And I got talking to a lady called Jane, Jane Burton. And I got talking to Jane and Jane said... Um, that she'd left her son in the centre of Liverpool, which was about six or seven miles away. And she said, I'll be getting the train back in to meet him later because, of course, being an epileptic, she couldn't drive. So she'd met me for coffee and we're talking away. And then suddenly she goes into an absence seizure. Now, an absence seizure is they'll be talking to you and suddenly they'll stop and they'll just stare at you and go like that. You know, within a few seconds, they just stare at you and then shake their head. She went into the absence seizure and I'm looking at her and suddenly what I can only call her daemon or something, manifests in her and she goes, what is he doing here? Mm. And then she shakes her head and comes too. And I was about to say, Jane, you've just had an absence seizure. And I was just about to say this and she cuts me and she looks over and she goes, what is he doing here? And her son walked through the front door. <gasps> oh, wow. And I went, my God, is that not absolute proof positive of my whole hypothesis? Wow. And that stunned me. And but what I, is that that's happening there? She somehow saw the future yeah, she when saw she the disappeared. So she was a little bit of ahead of her ahead of the body time, that was in front of you. As we discussed before, you know, the kind of the, right, the this buffering. Lapse, she this was buffering, ahead of the lapse. Right. Um, the people who, one of the, for instance, one of the known um, uh, symptoms of temporal lobe epilepsy, which people are diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy rather than ordinary epilepsy is when they have their pre-seizure aura, they have profound deja vu sensations. It's one of the things that doctors use wow. to diagnose it. Um, I knew one lady, she said that she had, in her aura state, she had deja vu sensations to kill for. She said she knew what was going to be happening for about 30 seconds in front of time. I had another lad who will remain nameless, but he's probably listening or he will listen into this. So I won't name him at all because he's a postgraduate student doing a postgraduate course in science. Hey, Tim. Kidding. Hi, Tim. How are you doing, mate? How did you know his name was Tim? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he contacted me because he, he has a tumour on his pineal gland. And again, he said he has deja vu sensations where he knows what's going to happen for the next two or three minutes. So I said to him, if you know that, why can't you prove it? Just turn around to somebody and say, I know what you're going to say next. Mm. And you know what he said? He said, that would never work. Think about it. They'd change what they he were going to say. He said they would change what they'd of say. Course. And he said, I would have split the universe into another universe. Now, this guy's a physicist, so knows fully about what's called Everett's Many Worlds Interpretation mm. of Particle Physics, which, again, we haven't really touched upon. We touched upon particle physics in the, in the earlier stage. But in 1957, a guy called Hugh Everett III wrote his PhD thesis trying to explain an alternate explanation of the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And in Schrodinger's cat experiment, the idea is that, you know, I said that subatomic particles, until they're, they're, when they're observed, mm -hmm. until they're observed, they don't exist. They are a statistical chance. They're a wave of possibilities. So in which case, if there is no observer and you put a cat, say you put a cat in a box and there's no other observer, and inside the box there is a device that will measure whether a subatomic particle in any given period of time, say in a half an hour period of time, you know that one subatomic particle will or will not decay. Okay, and if it decays, there'll be a little signal sent to a little hammer that will break a cyanide of gas, a file full of gas, will break the gas and release the gas and kill the cat. 
and you know that in the next half an hour that will happen. Okay? You put the cat in the box and you seal it for half an hour. So at any time during that half an hour period, the subatomic particle could collapse or not. But if it's in a superposition state where it is nothing, it doesn't. So in which case, until you open the box, the cat is both alive and dead at the same time within the box. We don't take the fact that the cat could be the observer, in which case that is would be Is this a real experiment that the guy put his cat in no, a box? No, no. It's s- just a theory, it, right? It's, it's, a high, it's, it's called a Gedanken experiment, okay. okay? Although when I first published, when I first pitched my book to a publisher many, many years ago and I put this in there, the actual person that reviewed the book for the, the, um, the publisher said, this guy is su- suggesting we torture cats. And right, I, I was going to say, and I had to go back and say no, what no. a horrible experiment. No, you know? Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment. Okay. In fact, a guy called Max Tegmark has extrapolated it to call the quantum suicide experiment. And again, you look this up, he actually proves by using this hypothesis that we're all immortal. And this is one of the world's leading quantum physicists. I think he's a quantum physicist at Princeton called Max Tegmark. Again, guys, just look it up on the web. Mm-hmm. Quantum suicide experiment, Max Tegmark. To make sure you don't really, I'm talking absolute rubbish. Okay, so... The thing is that Hugh Everett III said there is an alternative to this. When the box is opened, one scientist sees a dead cat and one scientist sees a live cat, which means that both possibilities exist and the universe splits at that point. Mm. So there are two scientists. Mm. From this, a whole new theory of physics came out called the many worlds interpretation, which means that effectively the, the wave function isn't collapsed because every potential is fulfilled right. to every observer. We've just split at that point. You've just split at that point. People are perceiving different wave or particle. It's now two worlds, not yeah, one. Yeah, two worlds that accommodate right. both. Now, people like Stephen Hawking are the people that believe in the many worlds interpretation. So if the many worlds interpretation is correct, that means there are trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of universes in which each universe, every outcome of every action is fulfilled. Right. Now, if you think about this, what does this remind you of? If you play a computer simulation game, what is on the CD-ROM? Everything. Everything that can right. possibly happen, which is now back to the computer simulation idea. Right. So suddenly, my hypothesis that you can live your life again and again, suddenly comes interesting. Right. Because it means that you can fulfill every possible alternative of every action in your life within the game. Mm. And I argue, my cheating the ferryman hypothesis, which we haven't really touched upon, I argue in the final split second of your life, that's exactly what you do do. You live it all again. You live it all again, only this time you can change it. And you can change it because your daemon will say, don't do this today. I mean, you guys today could have decided, you know, we don't want to go and listen to that Charlotte and let's go down to Brighton and have an ice cream. Not that you'd want it in this weather, but then again, you may, you know. But, but effectively, you could have chosen to do that. Mm-hmm. In which case, there's been many alternate lives that you have lived. In which case, you remember the alternate lives where you didn't fulfill this part of your career, where you didn't come and speak to me today. But there are other lives when you did. In which case, there might be a life where you will remember the future, alternate future of the things I've said today. So you'll still have those things that you thought about in your, 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 your theophany or whatever we want to call it, which you would never understand. Why did I ever come up with those ideas? Because a version of Natalie did come up with those ideas mm. in another alternate universe, which is backfed to you here. Because like the springs of a tree, the, the trunk has all the leaves and all the branches in it. Right. But you then choose, but effectively at this level here, you have subliminal memory of all these things. So in which case, all alternatives of your lives can be lived. So you could die at age 10, 15, 20, 30, and you probably did. But your daemon helped you survive. Right. You fulfill all the areas of your life. I have a tidbit to support this. Okay. Um, again, after the experience, when for quite a period of a few months... Pretty astounding stuff just was happening on a repeated basis until I left Malibu, basically, and went to the UK and there was a bit of a shutdown. That yeah, happened. leave Malibu. It's very alcoholic. <laughs> oh, it was it was very pure the way I was living. We were talking juicing and avocados oh, and right. stuff. Wrong kind of Malibu. You know, Malibu, the English drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It would be different, I guess, if I was surrounded by my British relatives, for example, it would be different. But yeah. So I'm in Malibu and, uh, you know, by the, by the beach, going going to go for a walk. And one morning, uh, 
I'm not sick at all. I'm completely well. It's Malibu. It's sunny out. And I go to leave and this little voice, this powerful, real strong intuition goes, take a tissue. And I question it. I'm like, literally in my head, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, my nose is not going to run. You know, I'm very, very healthy. But I go back because it's powerful intuition. Go take a tissue, put it in my pocket. I go for the walk down the beach. And this is very remote and you don't really see a lot of people. It's pretty remote. It's all private houses. So unless they're at home in the day, you don't see people. And I walk for about an hour and I stumble upon a photo shoot happening. And I recognize the guy that's organizing the photo shoot. I'd met him very briefly through a mutual friend and his name was Rodney. And we bump in, hey, how are you? And his girlfriend is the model. And we're talking and during talking, as was starting to happen at this point, my experience percolates up because it's really dominating my life. So he's saying how receptive he was and he believes in much more than what we're aware of. The girlfriend turns around and she goes, I'm really sorry. Does anybody have a tissue? And I get out my tissue and give it to the girl with just this sense of there you go. That's why I needed the tissue. That That is what myself and my group is, a demonic joke. It's the daemon just slightly giving you a nudge. It's like synchronicities. But, but that is a classic example of how the daemon can just give you clues. Now, it could be that just your Edelon, for want of a better term, subliminally remembered that the girl didn't have a tissue <laughs> and needed one. Yeah. Um, I, I give examples in my book, The Dame and a Guide to Your Extraordinary Secret Self. I was written, after my first book, I was written by lots of people who bought into the philosophy of cheating the ferryman and they gave examples of in their lives. And one guy who was really interesting, he was, um, he was a soldier in Rhodesia, as then was Zimbabwe, as now is, in the late in 1969, I think it was. And he was he was a soldier, and he was riding at the front of a he was on a machine gun at the top of an armored car in a place called Mount Darwin. And they'd gone up to to take supplies to a base, and they were driving back. And as they were driving back, they were about to come round a bend, when a voice in his head said. Ambush, ambush, dive, dive, ambush, ambush. He said he was so shocked by the voice that he didn't do anything. The next thing, he felt himself being pushed out of the, the where he was seating and he fell into the camouflage webbing at the side as a machine gun ripped right across where he was sitting. And as he said to me, he would have been hit in the throat, the chest and the groin. He would have been killed instantly. And since th at that time, this voice then became part of him. And he described to me just how effective his daemon was. And he went, he emigrated to America and he was working in a factory in America. And he said he had a cup of coffee in his hand and he was walking across the shop floor and his right hand for no reason came up like that over the coffee <laughs> as a blob of oil from the roof ah. <laughs> hit the top of his hand. And he went, bloody hell. How incredible is that? Yeah. And that shows how if you are attuned to your daemon, you can, one other guy, for instance, he told me he was driving along a country lane near Chester and with his family in the back. And he was driving along and suddenly his hands just went and drove the bus, the car into a ditch as a lorry careered along the wrong side of the road and would have hit them straight on. Clearly in another universe, he was killed. At that point, like in a computer game, bang, new universe is, is rendered hmm. and a new fresh universe. And the interesting thing is with those circumstances, your daemon doesn't know what's going to happen anymore. Because you're in a new universe and your daemon, just like your game player, when you make a decision at the point where you last played the game, everything is new to you as the game player as it is for the sprite on the screen. Mm. So the daemon is still there with you, but the daemon is just as confused. And I think this is why the phenomenon deja vu decreases with age. The younger you are, the more deja vu circumstances you have. And this is because subliminally you or your daemon remember that you've done it before. Mm -hmm. As you get older, the actual uh, mutations, evolutions of your life where you start getting into new areas mean that your daemon and your subliminal memory don't remember what's happening next either. Mm. So you can't predict in the same way. But I argue then you get near towards the end of your life and suddenly the deja vu start kicking in again or there's coincidences because it's preparing you 
for the moving over again. Yeah, I think I need to amend my little DMT theory that I mentioned just a few minutes back as well. As we get older, maybe it makes more sense that we're producing more of it rather than less. And that as it produces more, this is how this thinning of the veil yes. starts to happen. And this you is get more these I would ailments. say. Yeah, you get the Alzheimer's and this sort of thing. There is the, the other counter argument as well, which is calcification of mm-hmm. the pineal gland. Um, and as we get older, the, the pineal gland calcifies. Now, there the are certain conspiracy theorists say that the reason there is fluoride in the water is to increase calcification of the pineal gland to ensure that people are not, as it were, mm. of the alternate realities as they are now. I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. So I believe in, as, 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 a, as a qualified historian, my mm. degree is in history and sociology. I've studied history to the degree I know that effectively it's the cock-up theory of history. People aren't planning things. People in power are just as incompetent as we are. You know, I, but I believe that money speaks, and there are certain things, obviously, you can say. But I think to the extent of putting fluoride in the water to keep people ignorant is probably pressing it a little too far. But having said that, there is a direct link between fluoride and everything else. And the reason this works, and again, this is intriguing, it's to do with the, the pineal gland is piezoelectric, which means it can actually pick up on certain signals. Like it can act almost like a resonator or like a diamond or something like this. And this is how, for instance, pigeons can orientate themselves along vast distances okay. because they have in the pineal gland, there is a little chip in their pineal gland, which can actually pick up the Earth's magnetic field. So a pigeon, as you can imagine, the magnetic field comes out of the pole and goes out in lines all the way down to the South Pole. Mm. Effectively, a pigeon or a bird or a robin or whatever can sense and follow the lines of energy and it can follow them and get to where it wants to go. Mm. This is why apparently birds can't commute south of the equator. Birds in the north can't get lost at the south Mm. and the birds in the south get lost in the north. And this is because, of course, the lines change as, as you get to it the lines change the intersections change because of the way in which the electromagnetic well, the, 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 the magnetic field works and this again is known this is not this is not my supposition mm. this is known so in which case the piezoelectricity within the pineal gland I think is effective in terms of helping us attune it's like a crystal set like a crystal radio but because of the the, the ossification of it and because of the the, the calcification it means that it becomes less effective and it means it can't attune mm. in in quite the same way. But there's the counter argument is whether it's attuning out and whether the information field is out there or whether it's, as I would argue, attuning inwardly. And the final point here is that I argue that the tuning inward is to do with something called ORC OR. Have you come across this? No. It's orchestrated objective, or orchestrated objective reduction. It's a hypothesis put forward by Stuart Hammerhoff and a guy called Roger Penrose. Stuart Hammerhoff is professor of anesthesiology at the University of Arizona. And Roger Penrose is the Rouse Ball professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge. Both very, very big guys. Roger Penrose is world famous as a mathematician. Background story is that Hammerhoff is intrigued as to why anesthetics work. We know which substances work. We know how you can get knocked out by the substance, but they don't know why. Mm. Okay, and you just talk to any anesthesiologist, they'll Mm. say that we don't know why it is that these certain substances make consciousness disappear. We don't go to sleep, we disappear, and then we come back again. Hammerhoff has argued that it's to do with structures in the brain called microtubules. Now, each of our neurons, neurons themselves, you know, the the brain cells, are long, thin structures. And in order for them to actually be long and thin, they have kind of little little lines of tubulin to make them solid. And the lines of tubulin are actually microtubules. Inside the lines of tubulin have got these little structures inside. Each of these little structures have two lines of force, and they give off light. They give off electromagnetic energy and they create interference patterns within them. And interference patterns, which I think I touched upon, I don't know if you're aware, but interference patterns are why how holograms work in the first place. Now, there are trillions and trillions of these tiny structures in the brain. Each one of them is generating tiny holograms. Wow. And what they argue is, is that they are working, they are so tiny that quantum effects can affect them. 
So in which case it's our interface with the quantum world mm. through the microtubules. And they believe this is where consciousness comes from. Mm. Consciousness is not in the brain. Consciousness is created by the microtubules. Now, I counter-argue this and I say that the field of information, um, what Lynn McTaggart would call the field, mm -hmm. I do a I would like to believe I do even more of the science because I say it's the zero point field and it's to do with zero point energy. Uh, we probably won't have time to discuss what zero point energy is, but it is something that fills everything. And I believe that the microtubules can draw up data, information, digital information from the zero point field. And this is, what, this is the hard drive that runs mm. the program. So there's the hard drive, which is the digital information that's in the zero point field, mm. which is then drawn up into the microtubules, which then filter either into the pineal gland or the pineal gland acts as a kind of a, a reader of the hard drive. And this is where then reality is created. Like the uh, needle on a record player. Correct. Or even better, probably the, the laser on a CD-ROM. I mean, I think the needle on a record player I think is it's better. No, good, I agree. Actually. It's better. No, I, I'll back down on that one. It's a much better idea. <laughs> And particularly because it's more linear as well. So, yeah. I'll, I think I'll we go might have some older listeners who might prefer the record album, I'm just saying. No, you know? I, I think that <laughs> albums sound... I mean, I've got a whole collection of my albums around the corner. Do you know I lost my Led Zeppelin three recently? I, I bought it in Christmas... Christmas 1970, I bought that album, and it's disappeared from my record collection. So if one of you out there has got it, I want it back. <laughs> Not to take you from the quantum field to Led Zeppelin three or derail you in any way. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. fascinating yeah, information. Yeah, because one of the earlier... My, I love music and I love movies. You want to go on to the musical aspects of it, lad, we can do that as well, you know. But we so won't. pineal gland is like a, a CD-ROM reader, just to appease you. Yeah, a CD-ROM. You can see the egos just flaring up over there. A CD-ROM rather than a non-CD-ROM. Yeah. <laughs> it's too seedy, this ROM. It's I don't really, like this ROM. It's, it's seedy. It's, it's the really slutty seedy. ROM hanging the out with the ROM. slutty wave. <laughs> Absolutely, we've got it. We've got it. We've got it attuned. You know, we've got it right. And the here. Type A was it the Type A electron that's yeah, making and the card, everything? Yeah, the Kardashian, the Kardashian right. that wants to be in all that's places right. at the same time. We're building alternate <laughs> physics here, which is really, really good. But uh, yeah, so the, the model uh, for me works using the, the the particle physics and and using the the ideas of many many science points of view. I mean, many people will criticise me by saying I'm far too eclectic in my approach, but I think that if all the hypotheses of quantum physics, because one of the big things that scientists out there, and they're all going to panic when I say this, but you know it's true, guys, don't you, is that there is a problem with modern science. Relativity is one way of explaining the way the big world works. It works perfectly. It can explain the movement of planets. It can do everything, as can, as can um, the work of Newton. Really perfect for explaining the big world. Quantum physics, absolutely perfect. The most perfect science we ever have. Quantum mechanics can explain virtually everything from CD-ROMs to how your mobile phone works and everything else. It's all aspects of particle physics or uh, quantum mechanics. The two work. One deals with the very small, one works with the very large. Plug in the maths that you use in quantum physics into relativity, you get impossible answers. You get infinity. The two do not work mm. together at all. Mm. So therefore, they both cannot be an ultimate explanation for what is happening right. in reality. Somebody's wrong. Yeah, they're, or they're both right and they're not seeing the links below. Mm. And it's again coming back to the David Bohm idea of the hidden variables. The answers lie at a deeper level of reality. But because our present scientific paradigm is so preoccupied with material reductionism, and the idea that by taking things apart, we can explain them, it falls foul. Okay, I can take a motorbike apart and I can find out how a motorbike works. I won't find speed. And this is exactly why they believe with the brain. They believe by taking the brain apart and understanding all the neurochemicals and the way everything works together, we'll explain how the brain creates consciousness. They haven't got a clue how the brain creates consciousness. They're not even at first base on this, is what David Chalmers, an Australian philosopher, calls the hard problem of science. Mm. And it's because we're looking for the wrong things. And it's because an awful lot of materialist reductionist scientists deny that consciousness even exists. 
We are fooling ourselves into believing we are self-referential creatures. Yet every single human being on the planet, every second of their life, knows that is utter, utter bilge. Mm. But because science has got us in at this kind of worldview, they won't break out and they can't break out. There are even people called eliminative materialists who wow. be- believe people like Daniel Dennett, like Patricia Churchland. These are people that believe there is nothing going on in your head at all. Mm. You are being fooled into thinking you're conscious. Wow. How on earth something that is unconscious can be fooled by anything is a mystery to me because surely to be fooled, you've got to be cogent of the information you're being given in order to be fooled. But they don't seem to make that logical leap. Yeah, that one's a head spinner. It's a head spinner. When so, you feel conscious. Yes. To think that this is a trick now that I'm conscious. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's called a multiple drafts theory. And it was actually put forward by Daniel Dennett in a fantastically wonderful book called Consciousness Explained. And in fact, it was in Consciousness Explained that I came across the cutaneous rabbit, the Phi experiment, and all these things about time and the way in which mm. we can see the future. Dan Dennett didn't realise that he gave me an awful lot of information to make me go off on a completely different tangent. Mm. But effectively, this is the worldview. And as long as we are strictured by this particular paradigm thinking, I don't know if you know that there is a guy called Thomas Kuhn came across a hypothesis, I think, in 1970 called the Paradigm Theory of Scientific Revolutions. And in this, Kuhn argues that science doesn't develop gradually. It develops by revolutions. In other words, there is a belief system that explains everything with few things that don't work. And it's those few things that don't work that are the seeds for the next scientific revolution. Mm. For instance, in medieval times, everybody believed in the Aristotelian worldview. You know, that the earth was the center of the universe. Everything revolved in perfect circles around the earth and that objects moved in a certain way. However, there were certain things they could not explain, like they could not explain the retrograde motion of the inner planets. They couldn't explain why it was if you looked in the sky at certain times of the year, Venus and Mercury would go back on themselves, mm. whereas they should go just straight round. Mm. And they go round to a certain and then they go backwards. And, wow. they, and they couldn't understand why, because if the Earth was the centre of the universe and everything revolves around the Earth, that couldn't happen. So they came up with a theory called epicycles, which they did fantastic calculations that they were kind of going in little circles within the revolutions. And then they had to build other things to explain it. But of course, the solution as Copernicus came forward was that the sun is the center of the solar system and all the planets are revolving around, which means that the earth is the third planet out. So therefore, as we move around the sun, there will be times when the planets nearer the sun will seem to be going backwards on themselves because our revol- as we go round, it's, it's making it slightly different mm. because we're going faster. Mm. So it looks like they'll go backwards on themselves. So suddenly the light went on and everybody mm. said, hmm, maybe the other things that Aristotle said don't make sense. Like, for instance, how an arrow moves through the air. They used to believe that an arrow moves through the air because as it does, it pushes air in front of it, which causes a vacuum, which sucks the arrow into the next mm. bit and everything. And it, it makes the arrow move along. Makes rational sense. But they also believe then the arrow went straight down. But of course, arrows go in an arc. Mm. They just didn't perceive that. Mm. But suddenly, mm. by ditching one thing, a new science started. And of course, Newton then came along with his science. And we had Newton's science. And Newton's science managed to explain so many things that the Aristotelians couldn't. So there's a new paradigm of science, Newtonian science. And everything fitted within Newtonian science. Till we get to around about 18, 1870, 1880... And suddenly there were a couple of things that science couldn't explain. And there was a guy called, I think it was Lord Kelvin or somebody of that nature, in about 1897 said that we virtually explained everything. The only things that we're not quite sure of, there are two or three clouds on the horizon. And in fact, Max Planck, who will come into the story in a, in a second, Max Planck, when he was doing deciding what PhD to do, his tutor turned around to him and said... Um, no real point in doing physics anymore, mate, because we know virtually everything. Oh. So physics really is a dead duck, so don't oh bother. Oh, my gosh. But Planck decided he would continue. Okay, there's a corollary to this. So the problems they had was something called black body radiation. There was something called a photoelectric effect. And both these things didn't seem to make any sense within the way, modern, the way science worked. I won't go into detail on the photoelectric effect, but it's to do with 
black body radiation. It's to do with if you have something that re is a perfect reflector, there are certain things that should happen with the spectrum doesn't, mm -hmm. applying the physics of that time. Max Planck in, 19, uh, in the, the, the turn of the century was actually employed by a German company to actually create better light bulbs. Mm -hmm. The Germans were feeling they were being left behind by the Americans with Swan and people like that and with the English. So they wanted to, to create their own light bulbs. So he needed to understand how light was given off, how radiation was given mm. off. And he started to research this and he started to research back body radiation. There were certain things that couldn't, didn't work for him. And he really got very frustrated until one day in sheer frustration, he said, if energy wasn't continuous and it came in little bits that were separate, the maths would work. Mm. And everything worked from this. And he called these little packets quanta mm. of energy, where quantum physics came from. Okay. Quanta just means packet in Latin. Mm. From that, he could suddenly explain everything to do with black body radiation. But the problem was it meant that energy wasn't continual, but was unique and mm. specific, which meant that light couldn't be a wave. And then Einstein came along, and the other issue, which was the mystery, was the photoelectric effect. If you shine a light onto a surface of a certain frequency, electrons get kicked out, only at certain frequencies. If light was a wave, that wouldn't happen. They'd come out all the time, but they didn't. They just were kicked out. Mm. And Einstein's solution was light is not a wave. They're little tiny balls of energy that hit the surface at certain times and it kicks out the electrons he'd explain the photoelectric effect but in doing so again he suggested that light wasn't a wave but was a particle right but the whole of the science up until then was convinced that light was a wave so suddenly a new science comes on board quantum physics mm. and quantum physics then explains everything supposedly but we're now getting to the point now where there are things in quantum physics that quantum physics cannot explain. Mm. Dark matter, dark energy, the fact that 94% of the universe is missing. What, when you say missing, what do you mean? Effectively, if you look at the way in which galaxies revolve, they, they seem to revolve the further out they are the quicker they revolve, whereas it should be the quicker the further in they are. Hmm. And I think I'm right in saying, and I'll stand corrected, I'm quite happy to stand corrected, but as I understand it, in order for this effect to work, there has to be far more gravitational force, which means there must be far more matter hmm. within that area. And this matter is matter we cannot identify, we cannot measure in any way, but we know it's there. In which case, if this matter exists, what is it and where is it and why can't we measure it? Mm. And in approximately 94%, only 6% of the universe is physical matter, as we call it. The rest is dark matter. And within that, there is a dark energy which comes from dark matter. So there is a whole numbers of, of things out there that our science cannot measure. Mm. The mystery is what is it? Right. Now, one could argue these are the alternate universes that we, we see. In fact, um, a guy called um, David Deutsch, who's an expert on the many worlds interpretation, has argued, you know what I was saying about the single, fo single photon or electron going through the one slit? Yes. How come if there's only one going through, there's an interference pattern? He argues that, that actual particles from alternate universes hit it. Hmm. And that's what causes the interference pattern. Wow. In fact, again, I don't know if you're aware of this, but an awful lot of science these days needs something called virtual particles to work. These are particles that literally get pulled out of the quantum vacuum from nowhere. And they exist for a trillionth of a second and then disappear into nothingness again. And we have stuff to measure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That this these show up for a trillion Oh, they do, the they do. Oh, absolutely. Wow. They're called virtual particles. You know, these, these are things that are known to science. The other really weird thing that always stuns me is how many times in the history of science, scientists have thought, you know, there should be a particle here, and then they find it. There was one famous statement by, I think it was Glasso or somebody, who turned around and said, who ordered that? 
because they'd hypothesized that this particle should exist in order to make something happen. Then suddenly within a few weeks, two or three people yeah. discover it around the world. It's as if we think about a particle existing and it pops into reality mm. because consciousness has thought about it. Right. And that happens time and time again, which is again showing this link between quantum physics and subatomic particles. Again, Julian Jeans, I think, again, was it famously said in the 1930s, the more I understand about science, the more I think it's less of a great machine and more of a great thought mm. and the universe and the way the universe works. Wow. So consciousness is the prime point. It is consciousness that brings reality into, into effect. It is consciousness that collapses the wave function of a potentiality of a subatomic particle. I mean, for instance... The reason that the sun shines is because of quantum physics. Believe it or not. In what way? Okay. In order for, and in fact, how the universe started, hydrogen is the simplest atom. Hydrogen consists of one neutron and one electron. Now, a neutron is neutral, an electron is positive. Okay? And there you've got this little thing spinning around. If hydrogen... And at the start of the universe, there was only hydrogen. So for hydrogen to become more complex, a substance, it has to join with other hydrogen atoms to create new objects. But it can't because the electron is negative and so are the electrons of other hydrogen atoms. Now, if you remember, if you take a magnet and you took, took the two negative sides of a magnet, however hard you try, right. you can't make them go together. Right. And it's the same force that's inside an electron, which means that the electrons will never, ever get together because mm, they'll keep repulsing right. each other. And the only way they can repulse each other is if something curious happens in terms of the electrons. And what actually happens is, is that statistically, you know the way I said the act of observation, that an electron can be anywhere. It's a probability yes. wave until it's observed. The idea is that an electron can be anywhere. So statistically, there could be an electron that could be in a slightly different position in space-time where it will allow the two electrons to come together. Okay, I didn't explain that terribly well. But going forward then to the way the sun shines, the sun shines by converting hydrogen into helium by nuclear fission. But the same problem arises with hydrogen atoms as to how hydrogen atoms can convert into helium atoms because the, the, the electrons can't get together. And again, what they do is they, they do something um, which is called quantum tunneling. Imagine a wall, which is the barrier between the electrical field that's a barrier between the two electrons that are stopping them doing it. Statistically... There is a chance that the very occasional electron, most electrons statistically, when, they're, when they become physically real, will be this side of the barrier. But there's a, a million, trillionth to one chance that one might be the other side of the barrier. Just by chance. Billion to one chance. Right. Trillion to one chance. But there are so many electrons, there could be one the other side of the mm. barrier. And it's the ones, the other side of the barrier, which is called quantum tunneling, which then allows the helium, the, the hydrogen to actually cause fission to become helium, which makes the sun shine. I didn't explain that very, very well. But again, um, lots of books will explain this. I'm reading a book at the moment by Jim Al-Khalili and John, John, John Joe McFadden. Um, John Joe McFadden is a, a biologist and uh, Jim Al-Khalili is a quantum physicist and they're dealing with the quantum physics of life. And this is one of the things they discuss. Hmm. So the reason the sun shines is quantum physics. If we didn't have quantum physics, the sun wouldn't shine. Right, right. Okay. okay. Life wouldn't work in the way it works without quantum physics. You mentioned a while back that free will doesn't exist. I mean, do you actually think that, that we don't have free will? Well, no, but if you then extrapolate back and say that every outcome of every decision you can make is already encoded into the field, for want of a better term, you do have free will in the sense you can make choices. The only thing is... You only have a, an awful lot of choices. In fact, you have every possible choice you can make, but there is still a finite number of choices you can make. So, but you still have free will. Within the normal knowledge of the word free will, we do have free will. Um, just because we do. 
So um, basically, I mean, you believe, from what I, I gather, that, that we're living in a holographic universe. I, it's a, believe is the wrong term. I, I suspect from the information I have read and from the papers I have read and the research I have done personally, reading the research that other people have done, mm. I believe that it is very close to certainty that this is a simulation. Yes. And if that's the case, how much control do we really have over our own lives? Or is there really, we think we have control mm. and there's this daemon running the joint? Well, the daemon is you. So the argument is the daemon is you that exists outside of time. The one from the future. The, it's yeah. the me from the future. From, who knows all that I've, yes. I'm about to do. It already knows it. It knows it because it is your game player. So you as an Eidolon, there is an argument to say that when you play a computer game, the on-screen sprite, the Lara Croft, for want of a better word, showing my generation, does not have a choice on screen. Lara Croft can only do certain things. And Lara Croft can only go in the direction you, the game player, tell her she should go. I think in the Groundhog Life scenario, Lara has a degree of independence where she goes where she wants to go and the game player can only try to advise her which route she shouldn't take by speaking to her in dreams, by giving her inklings that things are wrong, mm. by occasionally, if possible, pushing her out of the, 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 the seat so that they don't get machine gunned. But it depends on how wide the doors of perception or the doors of communication between the daemon and the Adalon are. Mm. Again, many people have suggested to me that it could be a wonderful idea for a management training program to find ways and means whereby you can open the doors of communication to train people to be more a fay with and more listening to their daemon. Wow. And there's something that I could take forward at some time in the future um, because... I'm also a qualified psychometrician, so I, 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 I sort of do personality testing and everything else on people. In fact, wow. I managed to find a personality test, raw score personality test that Philip K. Dick did in the 1950s, oh, wow. which at the end of my book I apply, I do a full psychometric profile of Philip K. Dick. Wow. I wouldn't like to be in the same room as the guy. He was a very, very peculiar character. But effectively, I've been doing this in business for many, many years. I've been doing it for training pilots, uh, cabin crew. Mm. You know, I've done it lots of times, team building within companies, the whole kind of thing. But effectively, I believe that there is a way of finding, doing a psychometric profile of your daemon and your Adalon. Mm. And the way you can do it is that um, there is work being done by a guy, I think it's Stephen Schachter, New York psychiatrist. And he has devised a pair of glasses and they're effectively welder's glasses. And what he's done is they black out the visual field, the periphery visual field of both eyes, which he argues makes the subliminal self go to sleep, the, the regular self go to sleep, which allows you to then quasi hypnotize somebody in that state. And you can talk directly to the hidden observer, as Ernest Hilgard called it. Because um, hypnotists have known for years that if you take people into deep hypnotic states, you find another entity. Wow. This is the daemon, okay? Um, I say Ernest Hilgard worked on it, various other hypnotists. Now, this, this psychiatrist uses this technique. He doesn't call it the daemon, but he uses this technique to actually try and stop people having these problems in their past. Mm. So he talks directly to the unconscious. Now, I believe that if you could do that and you could get... The daemon, which is manifest in the brain at that time to do a psychometric profile, you could end up with a psychometric profile of somebody's daemon and then a psychometric wow. profile of somebody's adalon. Yeah. And then you could match the two together and say, for argument's sake, your left and right hemispheres of your brain, yeah. this is the real you. Well, you could also see where the conflicts are coming from. Yeah, and you could. Exactly. The kind of difficulties yeah. we have. Because... I argue, or I used to argue in my earlier books, I'm less arguing it now, though, because we have the two hemispheres of the brain, and I argue that the, the daemon is in one hemisphere and the edelon is in the other, and that the corpus callosum, which is the, uh, the, the thick body that holds the two sides of the brain together, when that's cut, people end up with two personalities. There are a whole series of experiments done in the 1950s and 1960s by people like Roger Sperry and Michael Gazaniga called split brain operations. Wow. And when they did this, they ended up with two people. 
Goodness me. And they did. There's, de- there's definitely two people. There's one very famous experiment done called the PS experiment, where a young lad had had his, his corpus callosum cut and he was asked a question about what he wanted to be when he grew up. Mm. Now, the right hand is worked by the left hemisphere, the dominant hemisphere. But when your brain is cut and you have a, a, this kind of operation, your left hand sometimes can be worked by your non-dominant hemisphere. So he's asked this question and he said, what would you like to be when you grew up? And he said he'd like to be, I think it was a quantity surveyor. As he said this, his left hand picked up some Scrabble cards and spelt out racing driver. Oh, my goodness. And as Michael Gazzaniga said, he said this means effectively that the non-dominant hemisphere of the brain has been overridden all the time by the dominant hemisphere, even though it has its own motivations and its own actions. In fact, there is something called alien hand syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of this. Oh, alien hand syndrome. When people have had a stroke and the communication channels between their left and right brains have gone, They will go and they will, for instance, a woman wants to go out and she wants to dress in a certain way. Her right hand will go and pick one dress and her left hand will pull her hand down and grab another dress. Oh, my goodness. And this is known, again, it's called alien hand syndrome. Oh, my goodness. It's a known psychological effect, which means that the two personalities are different. And they're different because they think differently. And they think differently because one is the daemon and one is the law. Wow. Maybe. That was my early hypothesis. I'm less sure now. I think there's more to it than that. That's simplistic because it's going back to the old idea you know that the creative left hem- right hemisphere and the non-creative driven right hem- mm. left hemisphere it's not quite as simple as that but there is lots of neurological evidence and this is all in my first book is the wow. life after death you know the stuff i've done is is is, is deeply researched you know there's nothing i say in my books that i haven't researched to the nth degree and gone right back to the neurology to the neurochemistry the lot that's why a lot of people find me a problem because I can't be dismissed as some new age wacko, you know. However deep they want to go, I'm happy yeah, to go. that's right. And because I have quite a peculiar brain, I can recall facts and figures. I was going to say, I don't know how you can remember all of this. I mean, all of these names. You must have mentioned 100 names in this podcast. I mean, I can't believe you can remember everybody and all these I, facts. I, people, I am infamous for being able to do this. Um, people find it bordering on the uncanny. Um, I've never been beaten in Trivial Pursuit, ever, 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 ever. <laughs> Nobody has ever beaten me in Trivial Pursuit wow. since it first came out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm in quiz, in quizzes, uh, in quizleys because because I'm interested in rock music. I'm interested in uh, music, classical music. I'm interested in football, sport. Mm. I, I have an uncanny memory, and the strange thing is, I don't have to think. When did I read that? It just comes to me like that. Mm. And I'm nearly always right. And sometimes I come up with things that I don't even remember knowing and I go and look them up and I was right. That I find uncanny. Well, maybe you were out on the astral plane doing research or in an alternate uh, universe. Maybe, but you speak to my wife, you know, and I'll I'll be halfway up the stairs and don't remember why I'm going up the stairs. You know, and she said, it's just the way your brain works. You know, when you're dealing with stuff you're interested in, you're fantastic. But when you're dealing with practicalities, you're not. And I'm not. I have Very that good. happen a lot. The whole, what am I in here for? <laughs> yeah. I do that. You know, senior moments, you know, I have them all the time. When you well, get to my age, you're going to have them, you know. As we, as we come about my record-breaking epic, passing three-hour. Oh, my God. Epic, yeah. brilliant podcast interview, which will be divided up uh, probably, if not three, certainly into two parts. I mean, I feel I should release you into your living life (laughs) so you can duke it out with your (laughs) daemon. Absolutely. Well, my wife has been on the phone a couple of times. Are they still there? (laughs) (laughs) Have you done an interview this long before? No, the, the longest one I've ever done was three hours. So you're about to break the record. Where I did a three-hour interview at LBC in London. Exactly three hours. It was or? exactly three hours. Aha! Three so hours, been... one minute, forty-three seconds. So, folks, this is the longest interview, and I'll put this up on Facebook now. This is the longest interview, and it's the longest interview I've had where I've been able to spin out ideas with somebody who's experienced these things, and that's why I think this this interview was so important. And I sensed it was when you contacted me. I thought, no, this one's going to be a cracker. This one's going to be really important. And I think because we have similar sense of humour as well, and I think that works, you know, and just having fun about these things. But at the same time, you know, these are suppositions. These are my ideas. It doesn't mean I'm right. It means that the information I have leads me to believe that this is how reality works. But I'm not a guru. 
And I have no intention of being a guru. Go out and find out yourself. Yeah. Check out the things when you come to my talks or you read my books. I will always give you the references to the documents and to the articles to go back. Make up your own mind. Yeah. And this is why people, when they get involved in my work, get so involved in it. Because it's not Anthony Peak, right? It's 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 so, it's a group of people we call we call ourselves Itladians, by the way. Hmm. Itlad is the is their life after death. It's the initials of my first right. book, and we have Itladians all over and Itladic ideas. As I was mentioning earlier, there are, there are guys just brought out an album called the Adelon and the Damon, based hmm. upon my ideas. There are painters painting pictures hmm. based upon. I'm in the hall. I'll show you in a second. There's a painting that was done by a guy that's been influenced by my work. It's influencing a lot of people and it's make, making people go out and do their own thing. Lots of other people are writing books based upon my ideas. It's brilliant. I Thank mean, you. it's absolutely, it's beyond an impressive body of work, the amount of research you've done. It, it almost confirms my belief in alternate realities because clearly there are many of you going and doing this there research. There must be. And they're all coming and reporting to this person I see in yeah, front I of must me. be some kind of quantum computer. That <laughs> That's are actually, right. They're doing all this work in alternate realities and coming back and feeding me the information. Right. And it, it does, it drives me. And I, I don't know quite why I'm so driven. You know, you think, you know, I've got my 66, 60 second birthday coming up in a few weeks time. And just the idea of doing that at my age, and you know, and flying to Australia next week and doing a three day event in Australia. I want to get over to the States. I've got two or three invites in California but what we're failing is to actually get anybody to finance getting over there. Right. And if this in, and this if this interview can help in any way in yeah. terms of getting that done, yeah. you know, Ions want me to speak. There are various other organisations very, very keen. Um, I need to get over there, you know, because it's. I would imagine that where my work will resonate. My point is, though, I do not do woo woo, and I I change my mind if something. I find that something I've said in my books and it's wrong, it's wrong. Right. I don't try to pretend it's right because that's not what I do. Mm. I'm after information. I think one of the major problems with the particular area I write in is there's too many individuals who are keeping things to themselves. There are, there are too many people who have these hypotheses and they just, it's theirs. And that's it. They don't talk to anybody. The amount of writers that I've tried to contact over the years that just don't even respond at all, which I find amazing because surely we are all here on this earth to try and understand what's going on, mm. that you've got one idea, you know, share it. You know, I always acknowledge my sources. I always acknowledge other writers. Mm. And I do because, not because I'm a wonderful human being. It's because I respect what they do, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's not, and there's nothing special about me. I'm just being fortunate enough to have publishers interested in publishing my books. Mm. But I really believe that my ideas are powerful and the powerful explanators, but I think I'm too eclectic. I'm involved in so many areas. My books are so wide in the areas. I'm not in one particular area. You know, there's all the guys writing about dimethyltryptamine. There's all the guys writing about near-death experiences. There are all the ideas writing about out-of-the-body experiences, epilepsy, shamanism. They're all got their own areas, but I'm covering them all. I mean, Lynn McTaggart is covering multiple areas as well because she had the field and she's also heavily into medicine with her magazine, What Doctors Don't Tell You. Yeah, which is good. Yeah, and, uh, you know, her book, The Bond, which is a whole other theory of how we shouldn't be competing and we're not supposed to be competing. And she, I feel she has multiple uh, areas Very that much she, so, that very she much writes. so. There are, there, Perhaps not as much as you Yeah, said. there are certain writers that come to me and I come to them and we can work mm. very closely together. For instance... As I met one of a couple of people I mentioned that you really need to follow up on. I mean, people yeah. like, um, there's a guy called, um, oh, uh, that is. Um, oh, this is the uh, temporal lobal epileptic seizure we're witnessing. Right yeah, now. no, it's the blood sugar. It's the blood sugar <laughs> dropping. Oh, well, it could uh, be that too. It is as well. Uh, <laughs> it but, could be we need to feed, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, probably. But th th there's um, people like Arthur Funkhauser on Deja Vu. I mean, Art Funkhauser is the one of the world's leading experts on Deja Vu as a phenomenon. And he came up with something called the dream theory of Deja Vu, which is absolutely fantastic, you know. And there's a guy called Andreas Mavromatis, who wrote the definitive book on hypnagogia, which you must get hold of. Andreas wrote a book called Hypnagogia, and his second book was called Travelling Light. And he, he is, he's got a PhD in psychology. And his book on hypnagogia is 
the best ever. It's oh, wonderful. I can't wait to get it. I'll get yeah. it tonight. I'm ordering it yeah, tonight. Yeah, or try and order it. And if not, I can try and facilitate mm. it for you because um, I know that he's republished the book comparatively recently. But it's wonderful. If you have hypnagogic images, you need to read his book. Mm. Fabulous. I barely know uh, the words to say thank you so much. It's okay. I'm so truly grateful for, for two reasons. Obviously, these are going to be great podcast episodes, but on a much deeper level, you are the first person that I've come across who really understands what I went through, what happened to me. You know more about what happened to me than I do. And I, I have the same sense that I know you mentioned Dr. Irvin Laszlo said, you're the only person on the planet he could find to write this book with. And I felt that way from when I first heard you on the podcast with Howard Hughes four years ago. I have to meet this guy. And it took four years. And now I've met you and I feel, God, I was so right. I really did have to meet you to hear these insights on what happened to me. And get explanations. So I'm just grateful on multiple levels for your time to take with me today. Thank, yeah, you, thank you so much, thank you. Anthony Peak. Thank you. Anthony Peak, seriously awesome, right? As always, links to Anthony's site and more will be posted at thegreyescape.com, as well as the selfie we took, which looks really good and only just a little bit holographic. I mean, Anthony looks really good, but he's a pro and he knows how to not look like you're in a hologram. I mean, you probably have to have the right carbs, the coffee, you've updated your firmware or at least your underwear. Okay, that's enough of that. That's just silly. And this is a very serious episode. Wow, wow, wow. Next week, another amazing guest. I know, how do I do it, right? I stay up all night scouring the web for insanely awesome people to bring to you guys and I have Tony Neck, an expert in the field of sound healing, founder of the Colour of Sound Institute in the UK. And I have this to say, if you're enjoying this show, first of all, thank you for listening. And second of all, I financially support this show completely myself, and I like very expensive coffee, and this new type of tea is really hard to find. I don't ask for money. I just ask for gold or a rating and review on iTunes. So please take a moment to do that. And of course, subscribe. That's super important. If you want to send gold, I can provide an address. If you want to just do the rate and review on the show, that's fine. I can provide a very sincere thank you. You can write to me at thegrayescape.com or check out my own site, nataliegray.com, for some of my art and comedy shenanigans. And meanwhile, I am very stoked to be back with you next week, vibrating in your head, which is a very favorite thing to do. So I hope you enjoy it too. Thank you guys again so much. It wouldn't be the same without you. And don't miss next week's episode. If the name Nikola Tesla means anything to you, and it should, you're going to want to listen as we ask the enormous question, can sound heal everything? I'm Natalie Gray, and I'll catch you next time at The Gray Escape.